We talked about loops being something everybody loves, about design patterns. Everybody loves design patterns, right? Very, very popular. We don't love design patterns. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. It's not for everyone. But they can, they can be painful sometimes. Sometimes they're unnecessary evil. So yeah. you may not love them, but you still have to use them. So what am I doing talking about design patterns in a course about reactive programming? So when you think design patterns is the book you think of, right? The gang of four. Elements of reusable object-oriented software. This is kind of like a seminal work on design patterns. This is what people kind of started thinking about design patterns. Like this is what started the whole thought process about design patterns and kind of formalized it. What, what a lot of people don't know is that design patterns are object-oriented. People don't seem to think about it, but it is object -oriented. You see that the title says, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software, right? So this book at least, the original book, was about object-oriented design patterns, okay? But still, this is going to be useful to us, even though we are not doing object-oriented today. I want to highlight two patterns, okay, for this discussion. The iterator pattern and the observer pattern. We are very, we're getting very, very close to reactive now, okay? So this is, this is the, the moment of the click is going to happen anytime soon, so be ready. I want to talk about these two patterns, the iterator pattern and the observer pattern. Two patterns in that book, which was mentioned long, long back, right? many years back, although reactive programming is a very new thing, reactive programming was sitting there hidden in that book, okay? So let's look at these two patterns. The iterator pattern. Here is what the, I think this, I got this from the Wikipedia definition. The iterator pattern is a design pattern in which an iterator is used to traverse a container and access the container's elements. The iterator pattern decouples algorithms from the container, right? We do this with collections a lot, right? We iterate over collections. Why do we iterate over collections? Because it gives us a consistent experience no matter how the collection fetches the data, right? You want to get something from an array list, you do a dot get, right? You, use some, you get something from a set, you use something else. You get something from a, a map, you use something else, right? So if you have to iterate, you have to write different logic for different collections, but the iterator pattern, you don't have to, okay? You can say, I just use the iterator language. So, hey, collection, give me an iterator. I speak only the iterator language. So the collection gives you the iterator, which knows how to iterate on that collection. So you don't care whether it's an array list or a map or whatever. You just iterate on the iterator, right? The consistent user interface, right? So basically what you have is the container giving you the iterator implementer, implementation, and then the consumer is going to talk to the iterator, right? Not to the container itself. So it uses the consistent experience. So the way the experience works is the, cons the consumer says, give me the next item. That's, that's as simple as that. It's a very simple API, right? So give me the next item. Give me the next item. The iterator is going to either give the next item or it's going to go, nope, I'm all done. Stop bothering me, right? Gives you the data or it signals when something is done, right? Say iterator pattern. Very very popular pattern, and we have kind of written wrappers around this pattern, right? There are various different ways in which we do this. But this should be very simple and very familiar. Yes, I do have a video on the iterator pattern. Best in the internet. Okay, I'll take it. Thank you. So yeah, please check it out. It's on my, uh, it's on my YouTube channel. So yeah, so this is the iterator pattern. Very simple. I'm going to move on to the next pattern, which is what's called the observer pattern. Okay, very different pattern, apparently very different pattern. So the observer pattern is used for when you need to observe something happening. Okay, there is an event that happens somewhere else and you want to do something when that event happens. We talked about mouse clicks, button clicks earlier, right? So observer pattern is great for that. So this book was written at a time when people were still doing front-end development in Java with Swing and AWT and all that. So observer pattern was very much in, in use at the time. So the observer pattern is a design pattern where the subject maintains a list of its dependents called observers, and it notifies them automatically of any state changes, usually by calling one of their methods. Okay, so basically this thing is saying, I can publish 
something in, in any point of time, right? Something can happen to me. Whoever wants to know, whoever wants to subscribe, let me know, right? So they listen, and then when something happens, it sends out. So for example, a button click, right? Something says, I'm tracking the button clicks. So a consumer can say, hey, when the button click happens, I'm going to give you a method, execute that method. Okay, this was pre-Lambda at the time, of course, with Lambda, it becomes a little simpler. You can just pass a Lambda. But basically, that's the idea, right? You give it a behavior. It used to be like a, an inline class implementation at that time or something, right? Some class, which is, which is holding some behavior, some method. You say, you know when something is going to happen. So I'm going to give you this behavior. Execute that when that thing happens, when, you, when that thing actually happens, right? So you're going to give it to that, right? So it's observer pattern. So... Here is what the, the picture looks like, right? You have a consumer. Here's the source of when something changes. This is something which is aware of when something changes. So you're going to give it an observer. It's like, okay, you're the observer. I'm going to give it to you. And you tell me when something happens, all right? And now this thing is going to tell, tell it. Right? So the source says, hey, I have new data. It tells the observer because you're not hanging around there, right? You're, got, you're off doing something else. The source tells the observer because you've given the observer to the source, like, tell this guy when something happens. And the source tells it, hey, I have new data, gives it the data. Hey, I have new data. This person clicks the button again, gives it the data, and so on, right? Does it work on PubSub model? It's kind of like PubSub, but uh, PubSub has a more, an implication of something a little more longer running, but a, I guess so, I guess so. I guess the purists will, will disagree and say, no, it's very different, but in a way it is, right? PubSub kind of follows the observer pattern, right? The subscriber is observing the publisher, right? So this is the observer pattern. I don't have a Java Brains video on the observer pattern. I, might, I should make one, maybe after this, after this course. Very different pattern, right? Very different model. The iterator has a very different model. The observer is for a very different use case, very different model where you're passing a behavior to a source, which is emitting an event. And then when that event is emitted, it or uh, the thing happens, the data is sent to the observer, right? So it's the observer pattern. 